Hello, my friends. Welcome to my corner. Julio Cortázar. I cannot think of another author to whom I owe so many hours of absolute reading pleasure. I have read every single one of his works, and if you asked me, okay, what is your favorite aspect of Cortázar's work? I would definitely say, without a doubt, his short stories. That's the reason why I'm doing this video. A top 10 of Cortázar's short stories. I'm gonna do this in countdown fashion. But there's another thing to it. I split it into. Okay, so we're gonna do first five famous stories by Cortázar and then five underrated stories by him. I thought that was the best way to approach this because otherwise you end up with the same top 10 that every person has, right? So I thought it would be more interesting if we look at famous and underrated. What do I mean by that? This is important. What I mean by that is famous and underrated here in the US. Okay, so if you're looking at this video from Argentina, you may think that some of the underrated stories that I have are actually famous ones. I'm looking at the US uh, reader's context. The last story that I'm going to mention, so number one of the underrated ones, just so you know, is actually my favorite Cortázar story ever. So I'm saving the best for last. So let's start with the famous stories. And number five is The Southern Thruway. This story about an epic traffic jam that inspired Godard's movie Weekend. This story is a great example of how Cortázar creates worlds, how he casts a spell, really. Reading Cortázar is like all of a sudden opening your eyes and finding yourself in a fantastic world and having no idea how you got there because he involves you that way. He is just fantastic at creating these worlds. The Southern Thruway is also a sociological short story. Why do I say that? Because if you look at the characters, they belong to different social classes, right? It's almost what Chaucer does in the Canterbury Tales, which is also a story about a journey. And the characters in Southern Thruway are not named. They remain unnamed throughout the story. The way you recognize them is because they are associated to the car that they drive. So you have an interesting comment there on modern society, how we come to be identified by the things we possess, by the machines that we use. Because of the car theme, it reminded me, of course, of J.G. Ballard. Crash, definitely. But also this idea of society uh, falling apart, of the masks coming off, I see a lot of that in High Rise which is one of my favorite Ballard novels. So other texts that you may want to explore if you're interested in these topics. If you are interested in stories that take a situation to its extreme and absurd consequences, the way the Southern Thruway does, I recommend a short story by Mario Benedetti titled Perhaps Beyond Repair. You can find this one in his collection Blood Pact and Other Stories in English, and it's simply a fantastic story. It's a wonderful read, so I highly recommend that as a companion piece to Cortázar's The Southern Thruway. Number four is going to be Blow Up. The original title is Las Babas del Diablo. For the English title, they chose Blow Up because, of course, this is the story that is the material, the source material for Michelangelo Antonioni's famous film about swinging London blow up, right? And in this story, what happens is that a photographer realizes that he has caught a crime on camera. It's different from the type of thing that you see in Antonioni's film. We have an obsessive narrator. And here, when we look at the narrator, you have to remember that Cortázar is the translator of Edgar Allan Poe into Spanish. So there's a lot of this obsession, right? Unreliable narrators, as in the case of Blow Up. From the very beginning, this narrator tells us he is not sure how to tell this story. And what happens as you read the story is that we keep switching from the first to the third narrator, right? So it's a story that is difficult to tell. And that's the way that Cortázar, or the narrator, um, signalizes that. It is also a story, because of the photography theme, it's a story about looking, about the gaze, right? And we have to remember that most of the time in literature and in film, the gaze, especially the male gaze, uh, gaze is punished. So, something to consider as you read Las Babas del Diablo or Blow Up. Michel, the protagonist and narrator, initially is an observer. But as the story progresses, he is forced 
to participate in the events that he witnesses. So in that sense, Michel is also like you. Cortázar did not like passive readers. He really wanted you to get involved in the material, in the text. And one of the themes that you can explore in Blow Up is the idea that art may be more real than reality itself, which is one of the reasons why by studying art we can come to understand the real world, the so-called real, real world, the world around us. So it's another theme that you can explore in uh, Blow Up. Let's move on to number three. Number three is Circe, or Kirke, if you want to go with the more appropriate and the more accurate uh, pronunciation. This was the first story by Cortázar that I read in uh, my whole life, and it was in the eighth grade. So, as you can probably imagine, at that age, it just went completely over my head. I did not understand it, but at the same time, I am still really, really thankful to our professor at that time for introducing us to Cortázar. So, uh, Professor Anina, wherever you are, thank you so much for that. We have the figure of Delia at the center of this story, and she is literally a femme fatale. We have, from the very beginning, a sense of expectation. Because we have Mario, the other character, the male character, who is Delia's third boyfriend. And he knows that the previous two boyfriends died under mysterious circumstances. So, you know, we know that, that something is, is going to happen here. And one of the themes, given this situation, is the anxiety of relationships and marriage for instance. This anxiety of being involved with another person that you have no idea, especially at the beginning and sometimes later, you know, either, you have no idea who they are, right? So a lot of that is going on in Circe. There are many dimensions to this story. Another one that you may want to explore is if you're interested in the connection between food and, and literature, this is a culinary uh, story. It uh, definitely has a culinary aspect to it. And in the personal sphere regarding Cortázar, this was also a cathartic story, because at one point in his life, I think uh, due to overwork, he developed an obsession. Uh, he was looking for insects in his food. He was convinced that there were insects hidden in his food. And he says that he wrote Circe, and that obsession, that problem, disappeared. So it was a way of, you know, coming to terms with a difficult situation, a uh, difficult moment of his life. There is a movie by Manuel Antin, the Argentine director, so if you like uh, watching movies in Spanish, I highly recommend. The title is the same, Circe, and it stars the wonderful and the immortal Graciela Borges, in the, uh, of course, in the role of Delia. Number two. Number two is continuity of parks. Continuidad de los parques. This is just a flawless short story. It's, it's almost perfect. It's one page and a half in most translations. It's amazing what Cortázar does in such a short, you know, space uh, and such a short time also. And this is a masterpiece about the magic of reading, right? The power of reading, the power of words, the power of stories. And also a perfect example of Mise en Abim. That's all I'm going to say because I don't want to spoil it for you. A few years ago, maybe four, five years ago, I had the opportunity to see Mario Vargas Llosa, the Peruvian writer, in a, in a talk that he gave. And he said that when you emerged from a reading of the great masterpieces of literature, like he mentioned Moby Dick, he mentioned the brothers Karamazov, it was as if the real world seemed poor in comparison. That is something that continuity of parks illustrates very well. This story is also a the perfect introduction to a literature course. If you're ever teaching a literature course, you can read the story the first day of class and that would be fantastic. You can actually read it there because it takes like five minutes to read. There is also a movie about it, also directed by Manuel Antin, who was Cortázar's uh, friend also. They have letters that they, that they exchanged. Um, and they changed the title of the movie. Instead of Continuidad de los Parques, they retitled it Intimidad de los parques, so intimacy of parks. And what this movie does is to combine continuity of parks with another short story by Cortázar, which is El Idolo de las Cíclades, which has also been translated into English. 
And very interesting thing about this movie is that it is set, uh, part of it at least, in Machu Picchu in Peru. So wonderful, wonderful film if you want to check it out. We come to number one of Cortázar's famous stories and that is The Night Face Up, La Noche Boca Arriba. This is a story written, I think, under the direct influence of the Chinese philosopher Chuang Tzu. I would love someday to get the chance to teach a course on the literature of dreams and this would be the perfect way to begin that course with a reading of The Night Face Up. I think it's also one of the best examples of Cortázar's poetics and what he likes to do with texts. It is just a beautiful interweaving of two stories that happen centuries apart. And as usual with Cortázar, the ending just, just wows you. And here we also have to remember that he was the translator of Poe, because Poe is the master of the ending. Those final lines by Poe are simply, you know, memorable. They're, they're, just, they're just great, right? And Cortázar learned a lot from Poe when it comes to that, when it comes to, like, shaping the ending of a story, which is such a difficult thing to do. At one point in his life, in one of his interviews, Cortázar said, the novel wins by points, the short story wins by knockout. The Night Face Up, perfect example of that. Question here, why did I choose it as number one? Well, uh, I would simply have to say, this is the story that I would recommend to anybody who was new to Cortázar. Somebody told me, okay, uh, I would like to read Cortázar's short story, so where do I start? The Night Face Up, without a doubt. If you like that one, then you can explore the other ones. You can explore Axolotl, you can explore Continuity of Parks, and all of the others that I mentioned. So, those were the famous stories. Now let's move on to the part that I think is most uh, interesting, the, mo the most interesting to me at least, the underrated short stories. And we're going to start at number five with The School at Night, La Escuela de Noche. This is from Cortázar's last collection of stories. So we're looking at Desoras and Reasonable Hours, which is from 1982. And it has a great premise. Two young men decide to break into their school at night. It's just a fantastic idea. And, and it gets better because once they are inside the building, they realize that they are not alone. Isn't this like the perfect idea? I, I love that. I would love to have written something like that. And I'm not going to tell you more. I'm going to let you discover what it is that happens after that. But let me tell you this. This story is an allegory. Remember that 1982, Argentina was still under military rule. We got democracy back the following year, 1983. So, an allegorical story. And the first time that I read it, I'll be honest with you, I was incredibly disappointed. I was like, no, that's not the way the story should have gone. That's not the way it should have ended. That's not what should have happened, etc., etc. Why did I feel like this? Well, here's the thing. There are two faces to Cortázar's development as a writer. First you have the more purely fantastic short stories, and I'm looking at the short stories primarily. You could say something similar about the novels, but this is we're dealing with the short stories here. So you have the more purely fantastic phase, and then after 1968 or 69, the more political stories, the allegorical stories. And what happened to me when I read The Night, um, not The Night Face Up, but The School at Night, was that I was expecting a fantastic story and I was not ready for the allegorical political yet. So that was, that was why I was disappointed in it. But as a political allegory, this story is simply perfect. It reminded me of Roberto Arlt's Mad Toy, El Juguete Rabioso, his first novel from 1920, I want to say 26, I think 26. Uh, the characters are also these young punks, right? So it has that connection there. And Cortázar recognized the importance of Roberto Arlt, which is, you know, a huge author in our, the history of our literature. Number four, In the Afternoon. They changed the title slightly in English because the original title was Después del Almuerzo, which means, of course, After Lunch. But as you can see, After Lunch, it doesn't really work as a title in English. In the Afternoon is much better. In this story, a kid is asked to take someone out for a walk. That's it. Is that it? Yes and no, right? You see, the thing here is that by the kid's attitude, 
towards this situation, right? And by the reactions of other people around him, you can tell that there's just something about this person that the kid has to take out for a walk. At first, as I was reading the story, I was even wondering if this was a person, actually, or if it was, you know, some kind of animal. Maybe it's not a person at all. And you continue to read in order to find out more and to see if you can clarify this uh, situation here. Cortázar loves to do this. I was reminded, for instance, of the doll episode in his novel 62, a Model Kit, 62 Modelo para Armar. Or uh, you could also link it connected to, uh, you know, Tarantino's film Pulp Fiction, the briefcase that we never see what's inside, that box in Luis Buñuel's Belle de Jour, that kind of thing, right? That's what we're dealing with here in, in the afternoon. It could be read as a story about prejudice. That's something, you know, if you want to go for the allegorical dimension of the story, that's, that's definitely um, a possibility there. But also, I love how Cortázar builds a very complex situation between the kid and the other person that he's taking out for a walk in just very, very few pages, right? It is also, very interestingly, a story that delights through frustration because it's the frustration of not knowing what we're dealing with here. That's why we continue to read in the hope that this will be clarified. But, uh, I mean, having that ability as an author to delight people through frustration, that's, that's just simply, you know, amazing. I wish I, I had um, something like that, right? Number three of the underrated short stories. This is text in a notebook. Texto en una libreta. It has a wonderful setting because the setting is the Buenos Aires subway, a place where I spent many, many uh, wonderful hours of my life. The story is very simple. We have a man who believes that a mysterious group of people live in the subway. They actually live down there. So this is a story about paranoia uh, with great allegorical dimensions. And I love how the title is so beautifully understated, right? Text in a notebook. Texto en una libreta. Like, what does that mean? Did something happen? Where was this notebook found? Did something happen to the narrator, right? Why is it texto en una libreta? And making literary connections here, I was reminded of Sabato's report on the blind, the third part of his novel on heroes and tombs, which is also a paranoid text, right? About a man who thinks that blind people are out to get him. So if you want, if you're interested in that sort of thing, uh, Ernesto Sabato's novel on heroes and tombs is a good, you know, text to check out. This story doesn't sound like much from what I described, but read it. It's just, you know, riding the subway, whatever subway it is that you ride, is never going to be the same for you. Number two, Nurse Cora, or Miss Cora, La Señorita Cora in Spanish. This is such a fun experiment, because we have a first-person narrator that keeps shifting. So the story is narrated in the first person, but that first person keeps shifting from one character to the next. And there is just no warning, so you really have to pay attention. The text forces you to pay attention, because otherwise you're going to lose the thread and you won't know who is speaking at a given point. Very simple story. A 15-year-old lies in bed in the hospital. He's about to have an appendectomy. And as I said, you know, we switch points of view, we switch perspectives from Pablo, the protagonist, to Nurse Cora, who is taking care of him, to his parents, to the doctors also at the hospital. And I don't know, have you seen Buñuel's film, The Phantom of Liberty? You know, you don't have a protagonist there, you just follow the story. That's sort of what's going on here. We have these shifting protagonists. Now, this is not only a wonderful literary experiment, it is definitely that, but there's also a great human element to it, which is the complex relationship between Pablo and his nurse, Cora. That's something that I always like to remind people. Cortázar is known for his fantastic stories, for his work with fantasy, but there's also a wonderful human element to his work. Cortázar is not, not just a game, right? It's not mere artifice. There's also that human element behind his uh, great stories, and that is something that I always like to point out. And finally, we come to number one. And remember, as I said before, this is my favorite Cortázar story of all time, and it is The Health of the Sick, La Salud de los Enfermos. This is a story about deception. It's the story of a lie. 
And at the center we have the sickly character of Mama. Her son, Alejandro, died during a vacation. And because she is sickly, her family knows that the shock of receiving the news of this could kill her. So what they decide to do is to make up a story about Alejandro accepting a job in Brazil. That's the reason why Alejandro is away and doesn't come back. And the lengths that, that these people go through in order to keep up this charade and the many complications that arise along the way just make for this fascinating and, and darkly humorous story. I was thinking as I read it of a German film from 2003, a film starring Daniel Brühl. You probably know which one I'm talking about. Goodbye Lenin? There are many connections with that uh, film. I have no idea whether there is inspiration going on, but it's a similar situation. It's a fantastic thing. And then for the health of a sick, the, the last line of the story, oh my god, did, did this guy know how to end the story or what? It, it's just simply perfect. If you want an example of how Cortázar ends a story, the health of a sick is also a fantastic example of that. And that's one of the many reasons why I call it my favorite short story by Cortázar. So, uh, we, come, we have come to the end of our journey. There are many, many other short stories by Cortázar that I absolutely love, and I, I would say he is probably my favorite short story writer of all time. I read all of his stories voraciously. Once I started, I just could not stop. And one of the saddest days of my life was the day when I read the last short story by Cortázar that I had to read, right? Because it was like, well, yeah, there's rereading now, and rereading, as you know, is one of the great pleasures in life, but it's just not the same thing, you know? So I remember being very, very sad when I had finally read all the short stories that Cortázar ever wrote. I would love to hear your comments on the stories. Uh, what's your favorite Cortázar story? Is there something missing in my list? Is there a story from my list that you did not like? Any comment that you might have uh, about this, I would, I would love to, to hear your impressions. I hope you enjoyed this Cortázar Top 10 Short Stories video. Thank you so much for stopping by and have a wonderful day.